Randy Moss is one of the greatest wide receivers to ever play football, but even that doesn't do him justice. Moss became the most feared playmaker of his generation, using his 6'4", remarkably lean frame to make everything look easy. Thanks to his long strides, he glided past defenders, burning them well before they realized their pursuit was hopeless. His speed into and out of cuts, the separation he created, the extra gear he rarely even needed to hit, he was unmatched. Even if a defender kept up, Moss's superior athleticism meant he wasn't actually covered. His dominance required new terminology as he routinely plucked balls from above his opponents who, as a result, got mossed. Throughout his 14 seasons in the NFL, Moss regularly led the league in touchdown receptions, including a rookie year where he caught more scores than any first year player ever. When many thought he was past his prime, Moss responded by setting even more records. He was a regular first-team All-Pro, earned a spot on the All-Decade team for the 2000s, was an easy selection for Pro Bowls, and once he officially retired, became a first-ballot Hall of Famer. Randy Moss was unbelievable. He was freakish, feared, but how is it that no team he was on ever managed to win the Super Bowl? How could one of the greatest to ever play the game, one of the most dominating forces in league history, finish his career untitled? Football is very much a team sport. One player, especially a player dependent on another position getting him the ball, can only make so much of an impact. That said, even in his first year on a Viking squad with plenty of talent, Moss was arguably the reason that Minnesota put up historic numbers on offense. Moss led the league in receiving touchdowns, setting a rookie record in the process, and as a team, no one had scored more points in an NFL season than the 1998 Vikings. With Chris Carter still playing at a Pro Bowl level, Robert Smith's solid ground game, and the aged but still absurdly talented Randall Cunningham who took over for an injured Brad Johnson, the Vikings lost just one regular season game during Moss's first year. It was the season that head coach Dennis Green had been working towards since 92. After gliding past the Cardinals in the divisional round, Moss and company were just one game away from the Super Bowl. His rookie season, and one of his best chances to win it all. Even though they faced a two-loss Falcons team in the NFC Championship, Minnesota was favored by 11 points. And although they gave up a touchdown on Atlanta's opening drive, it quickly looked like this game would get out of hand. Moss opened the scoring for Minnesota with this 31-yard touchdown where he hit an extra gear to pass the defender and catch a ball that no one else had a chance at. As Atlanta fumbled their next two possessions, the Vikings made it four straight scoring drives and held a 20-7 lead late in the first half which actually could have been bigger had Moss not dropped a pass in the end zone. But even with a 13-point lead, when Minnesota got the ball back at their own 18 with a minute 17 remaining, Coach Green had no intentions of playing it safe. Cunningham threw one in completion, then a second one, and then on third down as he looked to unload, Chuck Smith clubbed his arm, letting the ball bounce into the Falcons' hands. It took Atlanta just one play for Chris Chandler to hit Terrence Mathis and make it a 20-14 game at the half. Minnesota got greedy, and that's necessary if you want to average 35 points per game like they had, but this gamble was a big bust. When play resumed, the Falcons opened the second half with a field goal. Minnesota responded with a touchdown from Cunningham to Hatchet, holding Atlanta in check. And after getting the ball back with six minutes to play and a seven-point lead, it looked like they had the game ended. Minnesota marched down the field and took four minutes off the clock, primarily with Robert Smith on the ground. So with two minutes, 11 seconds left in regulation, Vikings called on Gary Anderson for a 38-yard field goal. As Fox kindly reminded viewers with this handy graphic, Anderson hadn't missed a kick in over 20 games, and in his 17 years of kicking, had made 90% of his attempts from less than 40 yards. So with the chance to ice the game, a Super Bowl trip on the horizon, Anderson lined up and pushed his kick to the left. And it's not good! From there, Chandler went to work against a depleted secondary. Despite little pressure from a four-man rush, he still let a pass sail on him and go straight to Robert Griffith, but the Vikings DB couldn't haul in the interception. 
On his next pass attempt, Chandler again tried to end it on the Vikings' behalf, throwing it to the end zone where this time two Vikings defenders got their hands on it. But again, Griffith couldn't cash in. For a third time, Chandler threw at Griffith. But his receiver was finally the one to touch it as Mathis secured the ball and the ref signaled touchdown. Atlanta tied the game up and Green played it safer this time, having Cunningham take a knee to send it to overtime. That's where Moss had a chance to end it. On a third and 10, he knew he had the defenders beat and threw up his hand, but Cunningham couldn't get enough on the pass. Moss had to come back for it and the safety caught up in time to prevent the completion. After a punt, even though Atlanta got the ball at their own nine yard line, by then the Vikings defense had been absolutely battered. Multiple starters and backups had been forced from the game or were trudging on despite being far from 100%. Chandler found his tight end OJ Santiago for 15 yards, then once more, this time for a 26 yard pickup. From there, Jamal Anderson went to work. Mathis made yet another catch and the offense fought their way into field goal range. Morton Anderson took his turn from 38 yards out and gave the Falcons the win. Moss's magical rookie season came to a close. While his numbers that day were fine, Moss had disappeared for much of the game. After the nine minute mark of the second quarter, he had just a single catch for four yards as the Falcons jammed him and doubled him, doing their best to take him out of the contest. Something he pointed out after the game, along with his frustrations about the offense not stepping up. That ended up being the closest Moss came for quite a while. He continued the production and the offense stayed near the top of the league, but the 1999 season ended in the divisional round against the greatest show on turf, a game which the Vikings led at halftime, only to see the Rams offense explode in the second half, putting the game away with 35 unanswered points as Kurt Warner proved unstoppable. A year later in 2000, the Vikings window got slammed shut. The offense was still rolling with Smith having a career year on the ground and Dante Culpepper getting his first season as the starter, proving just as capable at forging a connection with Moss. But even though they once again made it to the NFC Championship game, they were steamrolled by the Giants. Kerry Collins had a career day and put the Vikings in a 14 point hole two minutes into the game. From there, New York's defense held Culpepper to 78 yards passing plus four turnovers. That meant Moss could only do so much, and after the 60 minute beating was left with plenty of frustration. He put it pretty clearly, it was going to be hard to win a Super Bowl in Minnesota. They had suffered some bad breaks. When they got close, they repeatedly failed to finish, and other times, they just never even got close. Unfortunately for the Vikings, Moss proved to know what he was talking about. Over the next few seasons, things strayed far from the path. The Vikings won a combined 11 games the next two years, in part because opposing defenses had become effective in how they were playing Moss. Nicknamed the Randy Rules, he faced regular double teams and got jammed at the line as the league did whatever it could to contain the freak. In response, for a time, new head coach Mike Tice devised the Randy Ratio which simply meant 40% of the Vikings' pass attempts needed to go to Moss. An assistant actually tracked how many targets he got during the game to make sure they reached that goal. It was abandoned midway through 2002, but it goes to show how much of a focus the wide receiver got from every team, including his own. And although Moss set or matched career highs in 2003, it still wasn't enough for a return to the playoffs due to one of the most brutal single season collapses in NFL history. The Vikings started the season 6-0, averaging 30 points per game only to completely fall apart down the stretch. Players said they got cocky, they stopped doing the little things, and Tice couldn't put it back together in time. This was still a team with really good pieces, and with this core, they were more than capable of getting hot in the playoffs. They just needed a win in their finale against the hapless Cardinals. Minnesota even had a 17-6 lead with two minutes to play, but one Josh McCown touchdown led to a successful onside kick, which led to even more heartbreak. The Vikings defense had played well all day, and on third and 14 even managed to sack McCown forcing a fumble that bounced straight to a Cardinals lineman. 
With the clock ticking and everyone getting set on the fly, the Vikings just needed to defend a fourth and 25 to make the playoffs. McCown was chased from the pocket as time expired and heaved a 28-yard Hail Mary to Nate Poole, who only got a single foot in bounds, but thanks to the NFL's force out rule, the score counted and the Vikings missed the playoffs for a third straight year. It felt like a team that knew they were talented, but didn't care enough to be great. In the following offseason, there were a couple of moments that didn't directly impact Moss's chances at winning the Super Bowl, but they may have hurt him to a degree. So through Moss's first six seasons, his numbers were otherworldly and left no questions about his talent. Off the field though, there had been some less stellar performances. Following the 2003 season, there was a rumor of tension between Moss and his head coach, which was quickly shot down. A month later, there were rumors of the Vikings trying to trade Moss, but those too were shot down. People were quick to jump on the rumors, in part because they made sense. They fit a narrative that had followed Moss since he was a teenager. And once he was a Viking, the story stayed the same. So whether or not these off-season rumors were accurate, they were part of a bigger picture that would affect Moss's chances during his prime. It didn't help that during the 2004 season, there was a sense that Moss was no longer playing to his potential. He had talked about only playing when he wanted to, deciding when it was or wasn't worth going 100%. That transparency, mixed with moments like Moss leaving a game with time still on the clock in their Week 17 loss to Washington, led to questions about just how committed he was. But even with that loss, their fourth and five games bringing them to an eight and eight record, the Vikings actually made the playoffs. They backed into a trip to Lambeau for wildcard weekend. And despite dropping both games to the Packers that year, Culpepper threw four touchdowns, Favre threw four picks, and Moss got to deliver the final blow with his second score of the game, plus a celebration for the ages. That is a disgusting act by Randy Moss. The NFL agreed with Buck to the tune of a $10,000 fine. Moss wasn't bothered though, and it led to one of the best quotes in sports history. One week later, the tune changed for the Vikings. They lost to a very beatable Eagles team, in part from self-inflicted wounds. Minnesota tried a fake field goal from the three towards the end of the first half. It was poorly managed though, and instead of getting Moss lined up unguarded at the top of the screen, he had to leave the field to avoid a penalty for too many men. Gus Farratt was left wondering where Moss went before he just chucked it into the end zone. He looks right for Randy Moss on the left sideline. He's not there, and Farratt has no idea of what's going on. Back-to-back -back interceptions from Culpepper in the third, followed by a turnover on downs, helped Philadelphia put the game away. A game that would be Moss's last with the Vikings, at least for now. After the way that his time in Minnesota had started, it was a disappointment to fall off as fast as the team had. Moss kept being Moss, but that ended up meaning even his production couldn't save him. Moss got himself shipped off to Oakland. There was never any real hope of a championship from these Raiders, but those two years in the Bay are worth talking about for two reasons. First, Moss was part of an offense that couldn't get out of its own way, so he had the worst year of his career. And second, that poor showing meant some opportunistic team could swoop in and take a chance on the receiver that had now been written off by many. Once Moss got to New England, he looked reborn. Playing with these guys and being coached by this guy, it'll do that to you. Together they set a new record for points scored in a season, the second time a team featuring Moss had done that. But unlike the first time, they entered the playoffs without a blemish on their record. And after breezing past the Jaguars and Chargers, for the first time in his career, Randy Moss was playing in the Super Bowl. It was a rematch of week 17, in which the Patriots came back to beat the Giants 38-35. An offensive slugfest that saw Moss do what he'd done all season. Super Bowl 42, though, was a different story. The Patriots made it 7-3 to start the second quarter, and that score held into the fourth, when the Giants got on top thanks to Eli Manning hitting David Tyree from five yards out. New England's offense eventually got out of their slump, and on the 12th play of a drive, Brady found Moss for a touchdown to retake the lead. But everyone knows what happened next. Manning miraculously avoided getting sacked. The Giants miraculously avoided a holding penalty, and Tyree, 
somehow came down with the helmet catch on third and five. It was a play that overshadowed the fact that the Giants still needed a touchdown, but they got that four plays later, courtesy of Plexico Burris. New England's historic offense got the ball back with 29 seconds and all three timeouts, needing to cover about 40 yards to get into field goal range to tie it up. But first and 10 became second and 10. Second and 10 became third and 20 after a sack. Moss had a couple steps on the double coverage, but Brady couldn't get enough behind his 47th attempt of the night, and Webster broke it up. One play later, trying the same thing along the left sideline, the fourth down last gasp had even less of a chance. Just like that, possibly the greatest team in league history won every game except the one that mattered most. The loss left Moss searching for answers. He had put in the work. The team had gotten so close, but he was still empty handed. It cemented a hard truth for Moss. No matter who you are, Super Bowls don't come easy. The hits for the Patriots kept coming. The following year, Moss lost his quarterback in week one. Despite doing his best to mentor Matt Castle, Moss would have to wait for another postseason appearance. Once it came though, even with a healthy Brady, it was a far cry from the 2007 season. The offense never got off the ground against the Ravens, turnovers by Brady resulted in easy scoring chances for Baltimore, and Moss wouldn't record his first catch until four minutes into the second half, at which point it was already too late to get out of the hole dug by Brady. Now 33 and entering the final year of his contract with the Patriots, Moss spoke out about not feeling wanted. He wasn't sure what his future had in store, but it started to look bleak after a few weeks. New England sent him back to Minnesota, where he stuck around for about a month, caused some headaches, and got himself waived. The Titans were the only team to put in a claim, and he finished the season in Nashville without much to show for it. He had gone from the high of the 2007 Patriots to losing his quarterback to eventually playing for three teams in one season. A far, speedy fall for the legend. So after 13 seasons, Moss decided to call it a career. He had some offers, but none that he wanted to take. Because after all, this is the guy who said, I play when I want to play. But he didn't stay retired long. After a season off, he signed a one-year deal with the 49ers in the spring. And although he wasn't the centerpiece as he'd been for most of his career, he'd landed in a good spot. San Francisco didn't need him to be what he no longer was. They had Michael Crabtree and Frank Gore making life easy for Alex Smith and then Colin Kaepernick when he took over. Plus, this was a team built around an absolutely dominant defense. It all came together for the Niners, and an 11-win season was followed by playoff victories over the Packers and Falcons, games in which Moss had just five catches for 71 yards combined. While he'd been fine with the role throughout the season, leading up to his second crack at the Lombardi Trophy, Moss had plenty on his mind. He declared himself the best receiver to ever play the game, and mentioned how he was unhappy with the fact he wasn't being asked to be a playmaker, but made it clear he understood how things needed to be, and in the end, his goals were the same as the team's. Whatever he had to do, he'd do. Once they were in the Super Bowl and needed to mount a comeback, it was still Kaepernick, Crabtree, and Gore doing the bulk of the damage. Moss had a pair of catches, one of which being key on a touchdown drive that cut the Ravens' lead to two. He even almost had the chance to tie things up, but pressure off the left side forced a rushed throw on the two-point conversion. After a Justin Tucker field goal pushed it to a five-point game, it came down to fourth and goal for San Francisco. But once again, Moss wasn't the target. And once again, his Super Bowl opponent wasn't called for a penalty at a crucial moment. The pass fell incomplete as Jim Harbaugh watched in disbelief that there wasn't a flag. After 14 seasons, it came down to just a single play that was one more cruel encapsulation of the opportunities that fell short. That would be the final game of Randy Moss's career. He flirted with the idea of coming back, saying he would if it meant playing with Peyton Manning, but it never came to be. Despite playing on some of the best offenses in league history, that final hurdle couldn't be cleared. Seasons were ended by bad luck, another team getting hot at the worst time, a last second attempt not falling his way, and Moss just missed out. But 
the talent was never questioned. The career he had, setting records as a rookie, and then new records when people thought he was washed up, he was unlike any other. In a team sport, few individuals have impacted the game like Randy Moss. He's one of the greatest to ever play it, and there's no title needed for that to be true. Thanks for watching. If you want more Untitled, we've got you covered. What athletes do you want us to talk about next? Drop them in the comments, subscribe to SB Nation, and hit the bell for notifications. We'll see you soon.